and uh, being part of this discussion. All right, so I'm going to start with Dr. Fazana. Um, I want you to first explain to us, I don't know if it's scientific, what exactly happens in a student's brain, in a student's mind, um, psychologically, um, mentally, and uh, physically. I don't know what's going on in these students' minds that le that's leading to um, suicide and depression. So what my observation is, as a mental health professional, that most of the time when emotions are not expressed in a correct way, it can lead towards psychological problem, mm -hmm. mental health related, sometimes it can lead to psychotic symptoms, and then of course it can lead also to physical problems. So we are actually not aware about how we can understand and identify our emotions because that's not a part of training in any university, in any school. So some, for example, if one student is having emotional distress, he or she might not know how to express it. It could be because of economy, it could be because of peer pressure, it could be because of other relationship issues, but the problem is they don't know how to express it. That's the main reason in suicidal cases. That's how students mostly think even to commit suicide, and that's what we found in suicidal cases among students. Um, have you been dealing with some of these cases of uh, uh, students who are facing depression, and what are some of the cases that you are picking up? What are some of the causes of these uh, problems or situations? Okay, thank you for having me here. Um, so, I'm sorry I'm speaking for you students, but I've seen quite a number coming to my office and there's a sexual and reproductive health nest. Um, sexual and reproductive health issues are one of the major issues that are affecting students, especially issues of relationships. I think it's an issue of some of them are getting into relationships that they then fail to handle. There are a lot of disappointments. There are a lot of unequal power relations whereby there are these older men. And we also appreciate that you're facing a lot of uh, pressures to do with maybe provision of be it school fees, be it food, be it the nice clothes to wear. So then they end up in these relationships whereby they're forced to indulge in things they might not necessarily want to if things were well. So they end up indulging in sex and they're indulging in drugs and all for the sake of this relationship. So such things they do not know or are not able to handle and that results in them having problems that may lead to suicide. Uh, Dean Chaka, what, are, what is it that you're seeing in your office when it comes to our students? What are the issues that are coming through and are you as universities supporting them? And if you are, what are the support systems that are in place for them? Thank you for the question. I think uh, it is really apparent that the issue of suicide is really something that's affecting our students in a big way. And what I have learned over the years is that uh, there are many causes. So we've tried to sort of uh, you know, categorize the main trigger issues that affect our students. I think she's just touched on one of them, which is obviously the top one, relational issues. We also have noted uh, bereavement issues. When students come, uh, well, they still have issues from home, they've lost their loved ones, and when you get into the environment like a campus, uh, you do sometimes get a lot of time with your own thoughts. And if you don't have enough support system, a student can get depressed, and then it manifests while they're at school, because you also have the third issue, which is obviously the academic pressure, right? So there's a lot of work. Being at university, it's not easy. There's a lot of academic work and pressure that comes with it. And I think the fourth category that we've noted of late is, again, the financial strain and what it's doing onto our, uh, the pressure it's setting onto our students. And for the last part of your question, in terms of what are we doing as universities, we're trying a lot. Uh, this is one of them, partnering with Say What. Uh, but from deals of students, we do have health services and counseling services that's under student affairs. Who we've got practitioners, professionals, including peer counselors, to try and help our students. But 
like I'm saying, it's, it's a complex issue that we need to continuously discuss on. But we are trying. But maybe the last thing I'll say is I feel as universities we still need to get uh, more capacitated. We're not really, you know, where we want to be in terms of providing the right service for our students. We want to start and we have our university representative. We have someone from Adult Rape Clinic. We also have a doctor on the panel. So we want to hear from you, the students, what is going on, what are the causes of these things, what are the, some of the challenges that you are facing. I've noticed that, especially on the ladies' side, let me speak on the ladies' side. Um, we tend to bash each other down. We tend to say, oh, look what she's wearing. And I hear that. People are speaking about me negatively, and I hear that. I lose self-confidence. I lose love for myself. Thus, I get depressed. Me being depressed can lead to me committing suicide because I start to think, why, is, why are people saying this about me? Am I not good enough? So, I would think that in institutions, let's, as you know how um, physical health is very much supported in, in institutions. I think we should also try to make psychological health more at par with the physiological and uh, health systems. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my contribution is this. I think um, there is something to do with our culture. Our modern culture, which um, is promoting individualism in a way. So it comes back to the process of socialization. We must, as um, parents, uh, try to make our, our children to grow up with others so that they will be able, they will learn to bond with their peers and they will learn to bond with their siblings so that they will feel free to open up whenever there is a challenge. So if we have this culture of individualism, my sibling is staying in her own room. I am staying in my own room. So um, I think that kind of a separation, it, uh, it's actually reflecting in future. My contribution uh, is, uh, it begins by uh, probably referring to what the lady uh, alluded to on the fact that um, we tend to emphasize other forms of uh, our health. Uh, she talked about physical health. Uh, but then when we get to look at the African context, in the same way that we have kind of uh, taught or socialized our children that uh, probably men should be supermen, it's the same way our culture uh, doesn't really uh, put so much importance in terms of things that have to do with mental health. So you realize, uh, if I try to think in Shona of what we would have to say for the Shona method in mental health, I think we can think of Kupenga, and that is actually madness and not mental health. We don't even have the notion in our culture, it's as if it's a white man's thing. But that is not the reality. We are the same in our makeup and the same problems affect us. So it is necessary now that we recognize that this is a problem and it's there amongst us and we've got to recognize and begin to find ways to deal with it. And that just begins by that recognition that it is among us and it is a problem and that is we have to find a solution for it. So um, just one thing that I would want to say, because there are a lot, and I guess they'll come from the people, is that in as much as we develop our mind in terms of our intelligence and we talk of our intelligence, conscience and everything, we've got also to develop our emotional caution, our ability to be able to deal with different situations uh, as they come. So it comes sometimes from experiences, good and bad, that you've dealt with something before you are able to deal with it better, but sometimes it comes even from the information of people that have been in similar situations and so on, even the teaching in uh, class support groups and everything. But it begins with just that recognition that we've got to give the value that mental health has even in our African culture. And from there we can progress. Thank you. Actually, we received many patients and uh, the caregivers, what they say, they still believe while that they are having maybe some witchcraft, the person is mad. And actually mental health related issues are not for full life, full life. Some of them is very much treatable. Suppose there's depression, six month treatment, the person can go toward normal life. But still people believe that once the person was diagnosed, now it's a stigma for the whole life. 
which is totally wrong. The reason is also maybe lack of awareness. Mostly people, they are not really aware how important is the, uh, you know, the mental health. Suppose I will give you an example, if a child wake up in the morning and say to the parents that uh, I'm not uh, feeling well, I don't know what's wrong with me, I can't identify my emotion, I don't want to go to school, what will happen next? Maybe parents will say, no, you're just lying, go to school. Am I right? Yes. But if the child will wake up and say he's having fever, cough, or flu, any physical problem, what parents will do? No, they will say, no, you can stay home and rest. Okay, so that is different. Like, we are not really giving value or importance to mental health related issues. If you don't know, maybe your child is suffering in some emotional distress, which can lead towards suicide. That's what I believe, because many cases, we did some small researches also at our institutional level. What happened mostly when your emotion is not expressed in a way how it should be, it can go toward depression. And suicide is the actually symptom which comes under depression. Mostly people, they are in very much black and white. There are no colors in the life. And then what it result? Emotional problem result in relationship problem. Maybe break up with the boyfriend because the person don't know how to handle his or her own emotions and it can lead toward mental health related issues. Uh, if I ask you that, do you aware that how many emotions a human being can have? How many emotions we have? Anyone can answer? How many emotions we have as a human being? Would you know how many emotions does a human being have? No. Please explain to us. Okay, we don't know. okay. very easy question now. Do you know the strongest emotion? What you felt ever in life? In strongest emotion. Yeah. Anger, yeah, one. Another one? Love. Yeah. We have 27 emotions. The problem is that we are never trained in a way that we can realize that what emotion we are going through. Okay? And when we can't identify at our individual level how you can expect that we can help others. We cannot help others. And the strongest emotions are, yeah, you are right, love and anger. If you just Google like uh, life of successful people, okay, you will find out whatever they achieve in any field, good writer, scientist, what they achieve in their life, it was a result of anger or love issue. Because that is like a firing emotion. But we don't know how to use that emotion. And we result in a negative automatic thoughts. How we just start thinking how there was a student who was commenting, I don't know the name, but she was commenting, we don't know how to express our emotion. We just suppress. Someone said bad comment and then it was self-esteem issue. That time you never realize what emotion you are going through. That's why you never express it which can lead to a negative automatic thought and then it results in your low self-esteem. So if you know how to express your emotion, I'm sure it's not going to cause you negative automatic thoughts. So, of course, emotions are important and we are not actually have awareness by individual level and then, of course, on we can't tell others also that you know, what emotions we are going through and it leads towards suicide in most of the cases. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, it does around. Because, because the things that we didn't know about, just identifying the emotion that you're feeling right now. Um, I'd like to say that in relation to failure to cope with um, stress or anything that can lead to depression, right? Um, we have friends who choose to go to alcohol or drugs in order to suppress the stress that they have, right? Let's say um, I come from a funeral today, I'm stressed out, I don't talk to anyone, I go straight to the bar, I'm drunk, I'm drunk, I'm drunk, tomorrow morning I come back, I'm sober. Then I start thinking about it, I go and drink again. If I keep on doing that, right, I'm only delaying the inevitable. One day I'm going to sit down, I'm going to start thinking, I'm going to think deeply and it's going to hurt me so much that I will need to I watch that that can also lead to, to suicide from my point of view. And um, 
I think we need to help each other and find ways of expressing, find ways of teaching people how to express their feelings without feeling like um, they are being monitored, they are being um, discriminated. And suicide, yeah, I would like to comment on it. Because mostly substance abuse, uh, you know, diagnosis, what we observe, it's because of lack of catharsis, what the student was trying to say. Because we don't know how to express our problems. If there's no one who can listen, obviously the person will go toward more abuse of substances, alcoholism or banje or cigarettes or anything. So lack of catharsis, when you don't express yourself, there are many, uh, you know, therapies where we just say talk therapy. If you are not feeling good, you just talk to someone who can understand without any biasness, without saying that, you know, you are being judged by someone. You will feel 90% okay without any other treatment or any medication. But the problem is only that we don't know how to express ourselves first, and sometimes people can start using substances which can lead to what more mental health related issues. Do you guys have anyone to talk to when you are on campus, when you are in school? What exactly is the situation like? Do you trust your friends? Do you trust your uh, lecturer? Do you trust the dean's office? <laughs> Who are you guys talking to or who do you want to talk to? I raise the issue that in such a big institution there is no psychological counselor. And we had, there was a semester, there was almost four suicidal cases and still there was nothing done. And they will keep on saying the counselor is in Blawayo, but many students are in Lupane. So I think if we had uh, hire people to intervene in that, to make sure that Lupane State University has got counselors that are there and that, that counsel students consistently and effectively. Uh, I'm from Hill St. Jesus College, and uh, the issue is at school, they raise a professional counselor. But now the problem is with students, uh, they have that fear of going or of seeking help whenever they come up uh, with a situation or a challenge. So the counsellor herself, she tries by all means to encourage students to visit her office, but you find learners now, I don't know what happens, but year in year out, there are cases of someone who's committed suicide. The reason being, I don't know. What are you doing to engage students particularly? Are you going out there to the students to talk to them? What's the plan with um, adult Okay, so as the adult rape clinic, I hope by show of hands, some of you have seen us at your universities. Anyone? We do outreach and awareness. Oh, thank you. So we are going to universities. And we want and encourage students to be aware of their sexual health. Because the other problem, someone will commit suicide because they got pregnant and they were afraid of what they're going to tell their parents at home. Someone will commit suicide because they found their girlfriend sleeping with the lecturer. I'm sorry, lecturers. Yeah. But anyway, we need to be able to empower students on how to handle their sexual health. They need to know that there's protection. There are condoms in your toilets, I'm guessing. Please use those condoms. There are morning after pills. There is family planning. Use the services available for you. So the services are there in terms of sexual and reproductive health. So maybe I need to make a call for you to have a health-seeking behavior. You were just talking about how there's a nurse, but you're not using the nurse. So I also appreciate that there is need for healthcare services, for more services to be cascaded. Maybe please, in the meantime, use the services that are already available. Thank you. Uh, Ruby, you're from Adult Rape Clinic, and confirm, guys, when you hear Adult Rape Clinic, you think women. <laughs> confirm. Do you feel like that, or it's just me? Yeah. Would yeah. you say Adult Rape Clinic, while we are for university, and you go and try and listen, doesn't it feel more like it's for women? Does it? It doesn't? No, it doesn't? It does. I want to hear from the boys because I feel uh, maybe for us women, we are catered for. But do you cater for boys? We do. Do you cater for the men? 
We can't and for how? men, they're most welcome because of late, uh, the male survivors that are getting raped, it's just that sadly we are in a society where we've told men they cannot report rape. But please come through and report because we do have women that are abusing men. So yes, men are most welcome to report any cases. And do not be shy. If you have been raped, even if you're a guy and you feel you're macho, please come forward and report. And maybe I'll give you our numbers and our Twitter handle so you can ask us to come to outreach at your universities. And when we do come, please don't pass our table and think sexual health is not important. It's very important. It's one of the leading causes why people are then committing suicide. We go back to the floor. A lot of murmurings. Uh, I want to hear from a gentleman there. Yeah, you, the one who's next to yeah, was to me. They were very. Uh, yeah, they, it seemed like they have a lot to say about this. All right, my name is James Mandaza from Kwenpoli. From what I heard, there was this definition about rape. Uh, the, the person who defined it, they mentioned that rape is, is for women. Then the word for men, it was never been put on us. So, so when we hear the word adult rape clinic, so we just think it's for the girls. So the, we've never heard for men the word. Okay, so I guess we need to apologize for that. And we're actually working on changing it, so that I'm just justifying this. So for men, it's an indecent sexual assault. And we appreciate that, but rape sort of maybe come, came about as something that people can recognize quickly as an abuse. So maybe that's the name. Let's call it what it is. So for the males, yes, I appreciate that in a court of law, it's indecent sexual assault. So when that happens, please come through. And even if you do say you've been raped, it's a matter of semantics, really. Just the important thing is that you report it. They say that uh, they are counselors, but then we fear to seek help. Uh, the reason why it's because of the relationship and the age gap between the counselors. So as we in Rural University recently introduced the friendship bench whereby students are, are being trained to help other students deal with depression issues. So maybe we could do this so that it's easy to talk to other students rather than to talk to someone who is 40 years older than you. This person is older than you probably might not understand what you're trying to say. Thank you. I like that. I like that. Another, uh, someone, uh, just a hand uh, there next to her. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tanjuan Dakar from Point State University. So, when you're talking about the counselors that you are going to have with some institutions, we confirm that these counselors are there, but the problem is that some of those counselors, they are not that well trained to listen to our problems. Like you get to a situation whereby you tell your a counselor your problem, then the counselor will be writing down the notes, but at the end of the day, that counselor is just going to give you an automatic response. So those automatic response, maybe the counselor will just tell you that everything is going to be okay every day, just staying in there and something like that. So to give you an example, a few months back actually, um, I, was in, I was just in the outskirts of Blower Town, so I was putting on my earphones and I did a search of which had my phones and the laptop and all my documents inside. So then I got marked that day, right? Uh, so everything like, was stolen that day because uh, those people actually picked me up and then they took everything. So then when I went for counseling, they told me that uh, your phone, your phones, your three phones are going to be replaced. Uh, they are going to replace your laptop and you are going to take out, you are going to be given new documentation in terms of ID and birth certificate. But then what they didn't realize is that they didn't actually solve the problem. The problem was my mental state. Mm -hmm. Because from that moment on, I think for about two weeks, I didn't want anyone working for my behind. Because every time anyone was behind me, I usually thought that person is about to mark me, that person is about to pick me up. So I think the step that you can take is whereby these people that are going to be trained. And the moment these people that are going to be trained, they will stop giving us automatic responses. Because it's going to be useless if you're going to give me an automatic response. Still, I'm, I'm going to have that stress and I'm going to go through that depression and I'm going to commit suicide. That's, that's the This one goes out to you. You are not catering to the emotional status of the students. It's just we will fix things so that you can work and attain your your your, your degree or your whatever and then you can go ahead. But are you caring for the emotional state? of the student. Right. Uh, I think, like I said in my initial remarks, uh, I'm being very honest. To say as universities, we still you know, a long way to go to get to the levels of uh, 
some of the services or support systems that we want to give mm -hmm. our students. Uh, I know some universities don't have yet uh, a, a healthy student to counselor ratio, and also some of the information we're getting from students in terms of uh, probably the personalities behind the offices, because it's really relational and our students connect to certain type of people, including issues of age. It's something that we are learning about and as deans, uh, we've been working hard to try and standardize across our universities how we, we, we provide services to our students. So it is true that we are falling short in some areas. But also I want to encourage especially the students that get this amazing opportunity to come to such platforms, to be the champions of creating a, a culture of seeking help, you know, a culture of embracing counseling services and, 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 and communicating about you know, identifying depression. These have to be the champions of that. Because like we already said, context, as Africans, it's something we might not be you know, well versed in or talk about it as easily as the talk is said. So I'm hoping that a culture of counseling, a culture of taking care of each other on campuses is something that as students we should champion. And let's communicate to our deans, you know, let's communicate to our health services providers, you know, our partners like say what, let us, you know, let us open up, you know, because we need each other. I have, I have, I have been in student affairs for more than a decade and the worst days of my profession has been when I have seen a student who has committed suicide, you know, a young life, you know, taken because of relational issues. And you don't sleep. Actually, as us as deans, we actually need counseling ourselves, right? Because of the situations that some of our students go through and they share with you. So we really need to improve on that area. And I can assure the students that we're working hard even with Zimche to try and give these uh, very critical uh, support systems their space on campuses. I'm sure recently they were even about trying to standardize issues of accommodation. Because remember, we're trying to create, you know, holistic, well-balanced students. But unfortunately, as a relatively young country, priorities haven't been well matched. We started maybe with the classrooms, and then the other support services that come from student affairs are lagging behind. So this is why we are happy when we get such opportunities to be frank, to be open, and to be honest. To say, look, guys, we we know where we're falling short, and we need you to help us drive a, a better campus in Nairobi. Thank you. Okay, I would like to say there are three stages when someone is having emotional distress. The first one is very mild one. Like maybe for a few days, if you are not feeling well, maybe three, four, five, six, seven days, and your mood is not good about something, very short term level, sometimes symptoms can go by itself. Or maybe you just talk to your parents, your friends, your peers, <clears throat> that's sort of like, you know, maybe your grandfather or your aunt, uncle, who can just do it counseling. But that will be not a professional counseling. It will be just more like an advice on very mild level. Then there's moderate level, where you need a counselor which can advise you, an expert who is well trained. There was a student who was commenting uh, about the issue of confidentiality. So people who are well trained, obviously they are not going to broke any type of confidentiality. Like if you talk something, they are not going to disclose. But if you don't go to professionals, of course they are going to tell your story, everyone at the campus. Then the third thing is psychologist who can, also some people call psychotherapist, who is well trained in therapies like CBT, psychoanalysis, that level when you really have, suppose you are having something which is trauma from the childhood, which was disturbing a person, caused negative automatic thoughts, and you can't realize what emotion was leading. Maybe there was a childhood abuse, sexual abuse during childhood, which can lead towards some sort of PTSD symptoms where you are having maybe flashback, then you need a psychotherapist who can assist you, maybe taking you toward your subconscious level and cleaning the mind from there. So doing it on CBT, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, which can, which can work on here and now. So they are, and the third stage, of course, deal with the severe mental health related issues. Yeah. All right, I hope you guys are listening because 
Yeah, this is also helping me as well. Um, I wanted to respond to the question that the doctor asked why we are not actually standing up to voice out the problems. Because um, there's the issue of cyberbullying. For example, I'll give a case that happened recently in the University of Zimbabwe. I assume most of you got the case of the girl who was said to have tried to have an unsafe abortion. I was actually disturbed yesterday when I realized that she had been bleeding because she was having an abnormal menstrual situation. But already three quarters of the country is thinking that girl was going um, through an unsafe abortion. So can you imagine what she is going through herself right now with three quarters of the world already talking about it in the wrong sense? So, and she's still just in part one. She has three more years on campus. And everyone who looks at her is not going to be knowing that it was actually not the case of an unsafe abortion. So I don't know how we can then address this issue of cyberbullying and the internet. So for them, then now for me to come up with the adult um, rape clinic combi is parked in the station and they're saying, come get your services. I feel like people who just see you going to where these guys are stationed will think, oh, she was probably raped. And I think people find better comfort in actually staying with your problem than to be seen with two by two people going to get help. Because then you know by the time you get out of that trap, everyone is saying, ah, we saw her. She was going with, her, with those ladies who uh, were, were here to help people who were facing their issues. And at the end of the day, it's actually more stressful than dealing with your own situation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, my contribution is basically to say, let's not lose the cultural Zimbabwean African context in which some of these things happen. In Africa, in Zimbabwe in particular, we understand that Kune Mepo. It is a fact which we, we may scatter around, but uh, I think I need to throw it, and it so that it becomes also a debating point. These things, that's why we have to go to to churches and we also consult our parents and things like that because we cannot quite run away from uh, ourselves. I myself personally have suffered from depression at an early age. Dichendo University. I had a baby when I was 20, 19, 20, and that made me go into depression. It's a situation. Yeah. It's a situation that I It's a situation that I that I had to learn to get out of and strengthen myself. That's why even me, I believe in self-love. Guys, you need to look in the mirror and you need to tell yourself that you make it. Trust me, you, where I come from, where I'm coming from, where I used to be, I went to university for open learning. Uh, I was going with my baby on my back. But where I am now, when people, when I tell them that, but support system, as well as counseling services, helped me go through some of these issues. And I believe that for any case and everyone who is suffering from depression, anxiety, they can go through with that. Of course, that we can handle ourselves.